everybody, and welcome to another episode of Stacks and the City. I'm your host, Ashley, and as always, you guys, I can't help but to tell you guys hello and thank you so much for listening in and subscribing and commenting. You guys, I'm not going to lie, it's been a crazy week, not only with the protests and obviously us dealing with coronavirus, but in my small little world, y'all, my Instagram account has been hacked. I am hacked. So there's this random person, entity, being, mean person that is currently on my Instagram account at least as of Wednesday. So you all, please, I can't emphasize this enough, do not interact with that at all until I give you guys further notice until I tell you guys, hey, y'all, I'm back, I'm here, and you see my beautiful little face and talk about money and money management. So right now, Stacks in the City, the Instagram account is completely suspended, but you guys can definitely feel free to contact me through email at stacksinthecity at gmail.com, S-T-A-C-K-S, the letter N, the city, T-H-E-C-I-T-Y.com. If you guys have any questions, because I know a lot of y'all ask me a lot of questions about money and personal finance and homeownership in my DM. So there's no slipping and sliding the DMs right now, y'all. It's so unfortunate, but that's just what it is right now. It's okay. You are moving forward. I did have the pleasure of talking with Mr. Keith James of the Coalition Properties Group here in Washington, D.C. Uh, Mr. Keith is new, well, not new to the game, but he is recently awarded Rookie of the Year within the real estate realm. And I really had the pleasure of speaking with him in a one-on-one live Instagram podcast that I did with him last week. And uh, y'all, it was so great. I had so much fun speaking with him. Like I, I've said this before, and I'm gonna say it again. If I, I know that a podcast, I know that a podcast episode is really great. If I feel like I learned something from it as well, because I know y'all, we're all trying to get better when it comes to real estate and all that fun stuff. So I learned something new, and I'm really glad. I really hope that you all did too. You all, the interview is divided into three sections. So as you all are paying attention and listening to this, I want you all to um, really parse the interview. The first section focused on the investor side, so how he got started and more of that investor side of real estate. The second piece focused on the more residential side. So that's if you want to be a regular schmegler and get your first home, no big deal. I'm not trying to buy millions and millions of properties. I just want to call a house my a home. And the last gives you guys tips of what you can do, as well as providing a little bit of commentary regarding the protests um, against police brutality that has happened around the world. It's happened globally in the past week. So uh, guys, a lot of really, really phenomenal, great points. Pay attention to the questions questions that you need to ask when you are talking with a real estate uh, agent. If you want to interview them, talking about getting over your fear, we're going to talk about um, creating an investment strategy. If you are interested in going more of the investment route, some really great sound bites, failing forward, short-term sacrifice for long-term success. Definitely Keep your ears open for that, you all. And at the end of the day, I think one point that Keith made that I really, really resonated with myself is that you can do anything. If you have the desire for it, you can make it happen for yourself, but you have to want it first. You're going to find the people you want it. You got it. It's dripping like water. water. One last point I, w- I want you to uh, understand and see throughout this interview is the point of using assets to purchase other assets and liabilities and understanding what that is, you all. An asset is essentially the money that you make in your sleep. All you got to do is blink and poof, you're wealthier. And the way that you do that really is through creating some form of investment vehicle for yourself, whether that's through the stock market or the housing market or owning your own business. It's part of an asset, something that you have ownership in. So find ways to take ownership and whatever you use that ownership in, those assets, that's what they are, assets, things that you own, you use that to purchase other assets. So you just sit on piles and piles and piles of money for funsies. That's how this works. You want to expand your assets and limit the amount of liabilities or debt that you have, the people that you owe. Liabilities are important, you all, in wealth building strategy. So don't think that they're necessarily bad things. You just have to make sure that you're in control of them and you're using them to create your portfolio of wealth. That's what it's all about. So we are probably going to delve into that a little bit more. If you want to hear any 
thing more on assets and liabilities, let your girl know. But I'm done chitter-chattering away. Without further ado, here is the phenomenal Mr. James Keith of the Coalition Properties Group. Enjoy, you all. First of all, uh, I want to welcome everyone again to the show. It's Stacks in the City. I am Ashley, uh, but I am not alone, which is always the best. I am here with realtor extraordinaire, Mr. Keith James of the Coalition Thank Properties you. Group. How are you? I'm doing well. Thank you so much for having me. Oh my gosh. Thank you so much for agreeing to be on. So you all, uh, I've... I've been listening to you guys and what y'all want to hear and what we need help with and, and any questions that we have. And I really wanted to see who would be the greatest person to uh, delve into what a conversation of homeownership looks like for people in our communities, uh, as well as how our lives can can be a factor into um, that homeownership process. And I really feel like Keith is going to do that. So uh, we do have some questions, but it's going to be a little conversation. And by any means, guys answer. So first, Keith, tell us a little about yourself, what got you involved in the housing market, and yeah. how you became a real estate agent here in the area. Uh, absolutely. Uh, once again, thank you so much for having me. Uh, my name is Keith James, uh, one of three managing partners for the Coalition Properties Group headquarters right here on Capitol Hill in Washington, D.C. Um, we service home buyers and sellers and investors in the DMV area. Um, we also have great relationships across the country. Um, if, anyone, if anyone is out there that's looking to buy or sell. Um, and for me personally, um, kind of the main reason I kind of got into real estate was uh, I'm an entrepreneur at heart, and I never wanted to rely on a corporate salary uh, to bail me out month to month. And 90% of the wealthiest Americans get their wealth from real estate. And when I saw that stat, it just made sense for me. You know, uh, I wanted to start, I bought my first property at the age of 23, um, a year out of college from Tuskegee University. Shout out Tuskegee University. <laughs> um, and so uh, the, the, the thing that I think that um, I got over with that first purchase was fear. You know, a lot of times we just have fear of taking that first step and buying that first property. And um, once I overcame that fear of buying that first property and I saw the process wasn't as hard as I thought, I just continue to continue to buy and build a portfolio. I currently have a portfolio of 14 properties and I'm um, looking to grow on the investment side. So I do sell um, and help people buy homes, but I also invest myself. That's wonderful. Can you walk us particularly into um, the process of when you were 23 years old and you purchased yeah. your first home? What did you do? And tell us about how you got over that fear point as well. Absolutely. So, um, <laughs> that, so I had a mentor, and that's another thing. Um, you definitely want to develop a mentor or somebody you feel comfortable that you can talk to about the process, out, even outside of your, you know, realtor, so to speak. And I had a mentor who had done what I was trying to do. So I found that I, I found that mentor, and actually, thank God that mentor uh, was willing to uh, give information. So. Developing that, having that mentor by my side and having that person that could, I could bounce ideas off of kind of helped with that fear, you know? And so one thing that happened, um, when you are a person that never had money before and don't come from money, you don't understand how to manage money. Right. You know, so you graduate, I graduated college, um, 22 years old, and I'm my first year in corporate America making great money. And... After that first year, I saw that I blew a lot of money. I blew a lot of money. What were you blowing it on? Um, food, trips, um, things that were just unnecessary. I will say liabilities. Things that liabilities. were liabilities. You know, N nothing that was giving give, give me a return on investment. You know, I probably had some cash in my pocket. You know, I wanted to get a new car. And it was crazy because I had a company car, but I also wanted another car of my own, you know? So, I had that mentor reach out to me. Uh, the mentor reached out to me within a year's time, and I was basically embarrassed to tell him that I blew a lot of money. He said, "You need to." He said, "Keith, you need to buy your first property. Start investing in real estate right now, so you don't have any money to spend." And thankful for that, you know, I, I said, "Okay." And I remember my, going to the closing table. My first deal, I brought fourteen thousand dollars to the table. I closed on my home, and I had to spend fourteen thousand dollars, and um, that was the most money I've ever spent. But once I got over that fear. I said, okay, this is pretty easy. So I continued to buy. And in about a three years' time, 
I bought a total of like eight to nine properties. Wow. Y'all hear that? Uh, what made sense for me was understanding that looking at the mortgage I was the mortgage I was paying versus the rent that was coming in, um, the margins made sense. The margins, when I say margins, my profit margins was around forty percent. And anyone knows out there that pays attention to the market, if you're doing between eight to twelve percent in the marketplace, you're doing amazing. And real estate is the only way you can get margins like that month over month. Gotcha. So. Yeah. Someone asked eight properties in three years. How? I want to know how too. Yeah, absolutely. So um, the market I was investing in when I first started buying properties was uh, I bought in the neighborhood I grew up in. So they were, they were a bit cheaper, right? What neighborhood is this? Uh, in Columbus, Mississippi, north side of Columbus, Mississippi. Okay. Yeah. Shout, shout out north side Columbus, Mississippi. <laughs> where I'm from, born and raised. And so um, I also was able to, I had a guy my, my thing was to buy um, income, already occupied income producing properties. That was my thing. Already occupied income producing properties where I didn't have to go through a, a period of having tenants. And I, I, was, I wasn't spending any money. I wasn't spending any money. Um, when I bought my first property, I put everything to the side so I could hurry up and buy. Hurry up and buy. And also with paying my mortgage down, I also created equity. So I was able to and leverage equity to buy other properties as well. Okay. So, um, in case people don't 100% understand that, yeah. break it down for us a little bit more. Yeah. So, when you have a property, let's say you pay $100,000 for it. Cool. All right. And then, basically, you pay that mortgage down to $90,000 and your property appreciates another $10,000. That's $20,000. That's $20,000. Absolutely. There you go. <laughs> so that's $20,000 of cash that you have. And call it equity in your home. That's twenty thousand. I call it money in the bank, right? Money in the bank. So with that money in the bank, what you can do is you can the banks will let you borrow 85% of that money to put towards an investment. So guys, based from what I understand what he's saying is when you purchase your when you purchase a home by you sitting there and being pretty, your house is going to earn money on your behalf. Yeah, absolutely. So you absolutely. can use the sit down and be pretty money on top of any other income that you have coming from that property. By making those investments and I also was able to pick up once you start to get into the real estate market and start to deal with banks, so to speak. Um, what happened was I, I, I had every investment property that, I, property that I bought, I dealt with one bank and I built a relationship with that one bank and that one lender. Okay. And soon enough, what that bank started to do was anything they had, any properties that they had on the books in their portfolio that they wanted to get rid of, but whereas people probably had foreclosed on, they started to call me first. Okay. So guys, again, again I, we see the we have a few questions. We're going to answer those because those are really great questions to frame uh, what he's saying. But basically, he's from what I understand, you're out here, you know, making friends with the bank. Yeah. Building a relationship. Yep. Yeah. Foreclosed guys is a bad thing on for us. If we were to buy a house and it comes foreclosed, that means that y'all ain't paying your bills and the bank owns it. But yeah. the bank doesn't want properties, right? Is that correct? No. They want to get no. rid of those. They want to get rid of those. So when the house is foreclosed, that means that the bank owns it. That's bad. The bank doesn't want it. They're going to give it away. Not give Absolutely. it away, but it's going to be a steep discount. Absolutely. So that's his marketing strategy. If that's Correct me if I'm wrong. I want to make sure that we understand all of that. Yep. Yep. Great. So someone, we have questions about what is equity. Is equity cash or is it more like credit? That's a great question. Uh, that's, a more like, that's, a, that's a great question. So if you were to sell your home, if you were to sell your home, with twenty thousand dollars of equity in your house, and you sold it for a top dollar, and um, you would get a check. You can get a check after all the fees. You know, you would just call it. You would get a check for twenty thousand dollars if you would sell your home. What? Um, for what? Just for being pretty? Just for just for being pretty. Just for making that investment. Mm -hmm. Just for making that first investment. Now, if you were to take out equity, a HELOC, home equity line of credit, and that's what someone's talking that, about. Yep. That is, that is like credit. Even if you wanted to use that money to fix up the property or uh, do repairs, um, you could do that as well. So 
that home equity line of credit is more like a credit card with a very low interest rate, with super low interest rate. And uh, if you were to sell your home, you could take that cash to buy another property. Whoa. Yeah. Okay, guys. So a home is an investment. That's what we're doing. You're buying the house. When you buy it, something called appreciation. The appreciation means that just for you buying it, the reward you get for buying, for owning a home, is that it's going to cost more and more and more for other people, but not for you. You get the benefits of that. That's the strategy from what I understand he used to invest. That on top of him building relationships with banks and mortgage um, mortgage lenders because he didn't have yeah. hundreds and hundreds of thousand dollars. He had to get a bank Absolutely. to help him out. He was able to have access to other very cheap priced properties to help him Absolutely. get more Absolutely. of that. So he started creating a strategy, guys. So that's how, from again, correct me if I'm wrong, but that's how it seems you were able to build your real estate portfolio and accumulate so many properties in such a short amount of time. Absolutely. And then also another thing that I did was, and um, when I bought my first property, here, here, here it is. When I bought my first property, I leveraged my retirement account. What's that? Whoa, what's that mean? Exactly. So if anyone is looking to buy their first property when it, and they want to, they have a set amount of funds in their retirement account, granted, you can't touch that retirement account until you're 65 years old. Right. Right. So if you're pulling you're from your retirement for your first property, they will not penalize you. You will be taxed on that money, but they will not cut you that 15 percent penalty. And so you can borrow against your retirement account that you can't touch until you're 65 to buy your first property. So I leveraged my entire, I leveraged, all, I, I leveraged pretty much um, all of my closing costs that I had to pay, uh, go to the table with for my down payment. Um, I leveraged my retirement account. I leveraged my retirement account. That way I wouldn't be giving up my savings as much. And it felt better because I can't touch that money until, I, until I'm 65. I might as well make that money work for me even more. Even more. Whoa. So you're not you're not taking money out physically from the retirement account. You're borrowing. Exactly. What? So y'all basically, again, correct me if I'm wrong, <laughs> but basically you're still contributing and building equity in your retirement account. Yeah. But you borrowed it money correct. even though the money's still in there to buy another property. So basically you didn't spend any money and you're not getting penalties and and extra taxes from taking money out because it's never out. Yeah, that's a, that's a way that's a way to be savvy with your money. Now, yes, like let's say you have fifty thousand dollars in your retirement account, you take ten thousand dollars out of that retirement. Physically account. taking it out. You're gonna physically take that out ten thousand. But here's the thing: you're gonna use that money. You won't be taxed on that money because sometimes people don't have ten thousand dollars in the bank and save it, and that's fine. But leverage, uh, leverage, you work hard. Leverage that 401k. So you're taking that money and you're using that, taking that $10,000 that you can't touch until you're 65. You put it into a real estate property, an appreciating asset, mm. uh, something that's going to make money for you. So it makes sense to take that money out and put it into real estate. And here's why. The average appreciation rate in the U.S. over the last 100 years is 3%. And God, if you're in the DMV area, DC doubles that, three percent. So it, 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 it's, you're parking money from one asset to a more appreciating asset. <laughs> Y'all, that's called financial Houdini. And you guys, um, we're gonna talk more about what an asset is because again, some of these terms, I think, um, especially if you're an, either you're a new investor or if you're very new to this game, might be over your head. And that's okay. That's okay. We're gonna. Talk a little bit about what, what an asset is and how that works. But basically, guys, yeah. anything that you're using to to save away should be used to help you build wealth in. So yeah, exactly. I know people who have Roth IRAs, 401ks out here, and yeah. y'all out here taking that money out to move and buy a car. He's not saying Absolutely. that, y'all. He's not Absolutely. saying that. He's spending. The, he's not even spending the money, y'all. The money is still in his account, and he is using it. Yep. For another asset. That's crazy. Absolutely. We have a question. Someone wants to know, Keith, what was your credit score at 23 when you purchased your first property? That's, That's a good a one. Great question. Good question. That's a great question. Guess what, guys? <laughs> um, I have, and I'm, I tell all my clients this, and I'm not ashamed to say this. I had a 580 credit score, ah! $75,000 in student loan. Ah! 
<laughs> right. 580 credit score, and I stepped out there on faith. So what? Wait, why? So why? Who cares if you had a 580 credit score? And who cares if you had seventy five thousand dollars of debt? What? Why is that important? So, and let me tell you something. Once I bought that property, in six months my credit score shot up to a seven hundred. The bureau started to trust me. The bureau started to say, "Okay, you can pay a mortgage. All right, you're paying on time. We're going to increase your credit score." And it shot up. So how were people able to approve you even though, so guys I'm sure y'all know if your credit I recommend generally 650 really 7 yeah, six, 6 675 yeah, or absolutely. so in order to uh, get pre-approved for a home with the best interest rates that's what yeah. across the board so how were you able to uh, get that um, your first property get a first approval with a low credit score and with that amount of debt That's a great question so for my investors yep. out there, <laughs> you for got my this. investors out there, if you're putting 20% down, so I put 20% down. So the banks don't care. If you put 20% down, the bank says, okay. And this came from your retirement account. That 20% was this money my, borrowed against from the retirement account. Exactly. Okay. That 20% was from my retirement account. Cash is king, exactly. y'all. Exactly. So I put 20% down. The bank said, okay, you put 20% down. So when you put that much money down, uh, the underwriters, which underwriters are the second eyes at the bank that's finalizing and approving your loan, they're more willing and more uh, more accepting to give you that loan. Because the more money you put down, is less risk for the bank. So this is y'all. We know a lot about the investor side, investing. Yep. Maybe a lot of y'all aren't interested in investing. Maybe not yet. Maybe you just want to be a first time homeowner, have that pride and joy. What? Absolutely. How can we get started doing that? I, and I'm very overprotective. Let me say this: I'm very overprotective of my first time home buyers out there. <laughs> the way you really, the way you really want to get started um, is talking to an educated realtor, number one, and then also understanding your budget. Understanding your budget, doing some research too. Understanding the first time home buyer programs that are out there for you that you can take advantage of. When you're doing, when you, when you, and I always recommend uh, for first-time home buyers to look at first-time home buyer programs, whether they're state-funded programs and down payment ass- programs that are down payment assistance programs that are going to help you leverage cash at the closing table. So the way you want to get started is basically talking to an educated realtor, having somebody walk you through the process from beginning, from beginning to end. That's important. We walk people from the process from the beginning until they're getting the keys into their house. And you have to, as a first time home buyer, you have to visualize the process because this is not something that you do every day. Right. You need to understand what to expect next. So we do what you call a buyer consultation, which is very important. And actually, I'm sure you can attest to it, that buyer consultation and how important that is. It's important, uh, y'all. <laughs> Absolutely. How, how do we find this educated realtor? I, a big question I get from a lot of people is, yeah. how do I find a real estate agent? And one time, I, my answer was, ask your friends. If they like this, none of my friends have home, are homeowners. Then what? Absolutely. <laughs> um, I'm a bit biased when it, when it comes to this. So, you know, you can absolutely reach out to me. I have relations across the country. Yeah, but also link too, in the bio, y'all. <laughs> link, link is in the bio. <laughs> um, but also... Reading reviews online is very important. Reading reviews online. Googling real estate agents in my area, in D.C. Top real estate agents in D.C. And reading reviews. I always tell my clients when they first reach out to me, when we do a consultation, go read my reviews. Go read my, my reviews. That way, and I'm very overprotective of folks, first time home, I always say that. That way, you're getting with somebody that you feel, that you feel comfortable with. You ask them the hard questions. You ask them the hard questions. Don't be afraid to ask them the hard questions. What are the hard questions? What am I asking? I don't know. Um, yeah, so so you're asking questions like, hey, um, is my budget realistic for the market? Okay. Is my budget realistic for the market? You know, um, hey, um, how many homes have you sold? Okay, okay. What do you know about first-time homebuyer programs? Do you work with reputable lenders that are out here in the marketplace? What areas should I buy in? You guys, and I'm going to tell y'all this. I didn't do any of that. I didn't know about any of those questions. I just attended a 
real estate agent or like a real um, first time homeowner workshop and next thing I know I'm signing papers I wouldn't recommend that y'all uh-uh. and like I said I've told people I made a lot of mistakes about my first property y'all I will talk about, I'll put that in I'll talk about that later but you guys these to me this is so important like I'm so glad that you're saying so glad so these are the questions that you need to ask so someone says to you, you bypass a credit specialist and go to a mortgage specialist instead to buy a house that is a great question it depends on the. It depends on kind of where your credit score is at. All right. Now, if you're in the low 500s, I recommend you going to a credit specialist to help fix your credit. If you're in the like 500s, once you hit like that 620, 630 mark, you really don't need a credit specialist because most of the first time home buyer programs that are out there, all you need is a 640 credit score. All you need is a 640 credit score, and what's going to happen is. If you know what's on your credit report, if you know what's on there, you can give that credit report to the mortgage, um, the lender. You can give that credit report to the lender, and they can do what you call a credit rapid rescore that will say, hey, this is what you need to do to get to this score. It's called a rapid rescore. How long does it take normally for credit scores to go up? It depends on. It depends on that, 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 that. that depends on the person. Okay. Depends on how many delinquencies they have, which means how many things are in collections. Um, because here's the thing: it takes time for you to mess up your credit. So it also takes time for the credit bureaus to start trusting you again. So think about that: the, the, the length that it, t- that it takes you to mess up your credit, it's almost just like, hey, the bureaus are going to say, "Well, we need time to start trusting you again. Can you make this payment on time? Can you go get a credit card and start paying on time?" Can you get this stuff off your collections account? Now, if it's one thing on your collections account that you don't, because sometimes you, because sometimes you don't even know what's on your account. Yeah, if there's one thing uh, on your collections account, basically you can knock that off, and when the bureaus report again, that can knock your credit score up 25, 30 points. You know, it just depends on how how much of that is weighing down your credit. And I'm not a credit specialist. I do have a credit specialist that's on my team. Uh, and I, I refer people to him. He's amazing with the max credit score. And so uh, anybody who had who needs credit repair, um, you can also contact me for that as well. Got it. Okay. Okay. Uh, so we're going to do a quick tangent question, more on the investment side, and then we're going to move forward with residential because, again, I really want to hone in more on what it takes for residential side. So someone says that they're interested in buying a rental property, but they can't seem to get any lenders to underwrite directly to the LLC. Yeah, because they, an LLC doesn't have any history. An LLC doesn't have any history. So what I recommend, I recommend them buy that property in their name first and then create some history. I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I'm listening. Buy it, buy it in your name. Yeah, buy, buy, buy that property in their, their name first. If their LLC doesn't have any history of uh, income and expenses, that lender is not going to feel comfortable lending to that LLC. So would they buy their name and, and grandfather it into the LLC? Is that Exactly. They would buy that property and then grandfather it in to the LLC. Absolutely. Mm, I hope y'all out there taking notes. I know <laughs> I am. I'll show yeah. y'all mine later. Okay. Perfect. So we're, let's transition back into our, our wonderful first-time homeowner or home buyer. First-time home buyer. Absolutely. So they're asking those questions. They're trying to get their credit right. Then what happens? How are they getting up the, the down payment? What are the programs available that you're discussing? Yeah, yeah. So um, I can speak specifically for uh, D.C. and Maryland, right? D.C. has the D.C. Open Doors program, okay. which they basically match whatever that down payment is. They match that with down payment assistance money. Um, there's also uh, the Home Purchase Assistance Program in D.C., where basically if you make below ninety-four thousand dollars a year, they're gonna give you they can give you up to uh, eighty grand in down payment assistance, which is a lot. Yeah, yo, like twenty-one Savage, a lot. <laughs> twenty-one Savage, a lot. That's a um, lot. Now, uh, 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 now, I will say there is a program called the NACA program, which is the best program on paper. That's a national program. I recommend everybody, if they have the time, to look at that program as well. That's a national program, which is the NACA program, NACA program, which that's going to be the best money on paper that you can get out there. You guys, here's, here's, again, I like my themes. Tell me if I'm wrong. But it seems to me if your credit's right, you got the desire, 
You have you really shouldn't be spending too much of your money, of your own money, At even all. to buy a residential property. And what's crazy is, um, Ashley, with the NACA program, mm-hmm. they don't even look at your credit score. <laughs> Y'all passed out. <laughs> they don't even look at your credit score at all. They pay your closing costs. There's no mortgage insurance and no down payment. They take care of all that. Everything. So, guys, y'all, I'm t- not only is it possible, y'all, but, it, like, there's tools everywhere. And, you know, it's funny to me the way I see it. I think a lot of times when we see things that we want, we see it one on in one direction, like one dimensional. Like, you know, I want to buy a house, but it's impossible. No one wants me to do it. But the government wants us to be homeowners. They want people. Because the, when you invest in a home, you're investing in the community. Your taxes, in theory, are paying for your street lights and your schools and your streets and parks. So when you're doing that, you are truly investing not only in your community but in the country. So they're going to find ways to incentivize. They want it too, y'all. You want it? They want it too. You just got to put some work in. Absolutely, 100%. That is so true. Wonderful. Okay. So let's transition into the markets, what the market looks like, particularly yeah. in this area. We live in the DMV, y'all. I live in D.C. D.C. is one of the most expensive cities in the United States. We're up there. So let's say we are making that low salary. When I first started here, I earned $32,500 annually. And I know I'm not the only one with yeah. that. How in the world can I afford something where the median price is in the, what, the half a millions? Yeah, um, the HPAP program, that's the best program out there for low-income people that are looking to buy. It's called Home Purchase Assistance Program. I'm going to have all this stuff linked in too, guys. Yeah, it's a government program. It's a government program. Um, they, go, they will give you, if you, you're making around uh, thirty to 40000 they'll give you eighty grand in down payment assistance. And what happens is when they give you that money, it makes you, it, it allows you to be able to afford more because all you need to make for a down payment is 3% if you have a good credit score. And what happens is if it's 3% of 300,000, we know that's nine grand. Well, you got nine grand, so nine grand from 80 is 71,000, correct me if I'm wrong. After that, you're just basically buying down your interest rate to be able to afford more house. Y'all, this is financial sorcery. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So there's, 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 there's ways out here to be able to turn up. I was trying to the brackets, but yeah, there's ways there's, there's ways out here to purchase a home. There's no excuse. At least seek out information. Seek out information, you know? These are government-funded programs that they want to give to you, you know? So never, I, I was telling somebody this morning, you know, um, never take the word no. Find out for yourself, you know? Step out there on faith. Ask questions. You don't know until you start. You know, my favorite motto is um, short-term sacrifice for long-term success. And if you if you, if you you take time out to put in the work, you never know what the outcome will be. Y'all, he got me want to sing Negro Slave Spirituals. I don't know if I can say that right now, given the time. But, you know, I, that's how I feel right now, y'all. That's how I feel. Yeah, we all feel like that. Right? So there is no excuse. And, you know, I'm not sure, um, you know, based on your experience, obviously you're the expert here too, but it's also cost and what people are able to afford. I think a lot of us do want that beautiful, sexy, Instagrammable home. And maybe our budgets are telling us, you know, a little two, one bedroom combo. Yeah. So, yes, that's so true. And when you're in a market like DC, which is the number one real estate market in the country, you need to just get an asset. You need to get into the market because when you get into when you get into the market, I don't care if you make fifty thousand dollars, forty thousand dollars. If you get into the market and can afford and, and, and buy something, that house is going to appreciate. I said earlier the average appreciation rate in the U.S. over the last one hundred years is three percent. DC doubles that. You know what I mean? That's so, six, y'all. Three plus three is six. Percent. Get into the market, buy a property, and watch that property appreciate. Watch that property appreciate. And then you go buy your forever home. You take that cash from when you sell, the average homeowner stays in their house for five to seven years. You take that money, and then you go buy your forever home. Make some money first. So the first time homeowner isn't necessarily going to be the home you're going to live in forever. Is that what you're I saying, too? Absolutely. I tell my clients, if it's your first property, you shouldn't be looking for your forever home. You just shouldn't be looking for your forever home. 
especially millennials, especially millennials should not be going out here on that first purchase looking for their forever home. And I preach that to my clients. You want an appreciating asset that you can leverage for your portfolio. Because as a millennial, you need to be investing aggressively. Because you've got time to make it up if you fail. You, you, all you want to do is hit singles out here. You know, you got time. To, if you fail, okay, you get back up, do it again. You got time. You fail forward. You fail forward. Yeah, y'all, fail forward. I'm going to put that, we're going to quote that too, y'all. Fail forward. <laughs> That sounds oxymoronic, don't it, y'all? We will transition one more time, y'all. And I really want to discuss how the recent events, not even coronavirus, we could talk about that, but how the murder of George Floyd and countless other African Americans in this country has affected the housing market, if it has at all. Now, you all, you, I think it's funny. We don't necessarily think that these things are related, but in my, I think they are. I think economics, I think your money, all that, all these things are related. And I want to hear, um, Keith, what your thoughts are on that and what you've noticed, particularly in the past week in D.C. Very, very touchy subject. Absolutely. Um, I, I will say, um, as a black man, we're tired. <laughs> First off, let me just put that out. We're tired. We're fed up. You know, um, we're tired of being denied access to the same opportunities as our counterparts, you know, as white America. We're, di- we're tired of being denied access. We're tired of having the same credentials on paper as white America and going to the banks and being denied loans. You know what I mean? So when you talk about how that yeah. directly correlates with what's going on, it's all tied into together. Yes. Now, let me tell you guys something. Martin Luther King didn't get shot for the I Have a Dream speech. He got shot when he started to talk about economic equality for black people. When he made that speech in Stanford, that's when white America said, you know what? We were good. We were talking about civil rights and stuff like that, you know. But when you start talking about economic inclusion, that's a whole they, that's a whole other category. That's a whole other category. We want to keep you oppressed. You know, we don't want you to be able to go to the bank and get the same loans we can get and grant the same opportunities we can get. We don't, we, we shouldn't have, you shouldn't have those opportunities. Yeah. So best believe all this stuff is tied together. We're, we're tired of that. And so when you talk about um, when they made those laws on real estate, let me tell you this, real estate is the most beneficial investment that you can make. And when they was making those laws and rules about real estate, we weren't at the tables. But guess what? They're not going to change those rules because 90% of the wealthiest Americans get their wealth from real estate. They're not going to change those rules. So we need to be a part of that. We need to be taking advantage of that. We need to be included. We need to be buying the block because we have the opportunity to do so. Do so. We need to come together, pull our resources together, and get out here and grind it out and be successful and leave something for the next generation. That's why I named my my investment LLC, Next Generation Investments. You need to be able to get out here and leave something for the next generation. That's what it's all about. Amen. And it started, we're tired, we're tired. That's why you're seeing it right. Like, we're tired, you know? The the names change, but the colors stay the same. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, it's interesting uh, that you say that because um, I, it took me... Uh, what, what, 10, 15 years to buy my first property too. And I bought it here in DC. A, I read avidly and I talk about how important reading is. And there was still, I'm talking to you right now and there was still stuff I didn't know. Still stuff I didn't know. I got pre-approved for $218,000 for my first property when I was 24 years old in this area, which isn't a lot of money, guys. If you live, if you uh, don't live in DC, that's not a lot for a home here, for at least a comfortable home here. And, um, but I, I bought it anyway. I was super proud. But there were people that I went to school with who bought property in Bethesda area, this beautiful, like sprawling, you know, y'all, if y'all know Bethesda, y'all know. Yeah. Huge place. What? Probably in the million, probably the upper nines, in the low yeah. millions. And I'm just like, what? We went to the same school. We, I mean, I'm pretty sure my grades may or may not have been better than yours. But how did you have access to that? And I, I was approved for this. Like, is it? Wow. 
you know, and that's something that really sticks with me. But part of it is, well, their parents have homes. And like you said, they know the whole make an asset into another asset. So it's likely that they helped out. Helping out isn't taking money from their savings. Helping out is like you said, I'm borrowing from my Roth IRA, or sorry, from my 401k to give as a wedding present or a graduation gift. Exactly. That's what that is. And to exactly. me, when we talk about inequity, it looks like that too. Absolutely. Because I don't have that. I didn't have that. And, I'm, and from your stories, no, you didn't have that either. I, I definitely didn't have that. I definitely didn't have that. I, I think it's important too. You know, I, I, it's it's very easy, you guys, to be to get discouraged, especially if you are a first time homeowner, and if you are a first generation homeowner as well. And again, Keith has talked so much about this um, throughout our conversation. You know, if those things are the case, it's, it is going to be likely that you'll see those discrepancies. You probably will get denied for a mortgage. It may take you longer because your credit score is lower because your mom was putting your name in her phone bill back in the day. That's what inequality looks like, y'all. But you have to, you have to, we just have to work harder. I hate the phrase work hard to get half as much. I don't know about, but I hate that. I'm just going to work hard to get as much as I need and I'm going to keep working to get it. Exactly. So guys, we understand that it could get frustrating, but there are people out here like Keith who are who are available to walk you through every Absolutely. single step. And if there's a Absolutely. question you don't know, Absolutely. if he doesn't know it, then he knows someone who will. And that's what you want at the end of the day to look for and someone who will advocate for you in this yeah. process. There is no no. There is no no. I will pull up for my clients. <laughs> skirt, skirt, I y'all. I will pull up for my clients. I definitely will. Absolutely. Perfect. So, guys, we are winding down a little bit. Keith, is there anything that you want to let people know? There are a few DMV people in this area uh, on the call, I can tell. What is it called? Po- Sorry, y'all, on the podcast. So, is there anything you want people to know? Any lasting words? Any parting words from us? Absolutely. Um, just, you know, just uh, take the leap of faith. You know, if you're a first time home buyer, uh, don't get discouraged. You know, uh, Coalition Properties, our mission is to be the bridge to our community for all things real estate, lifestyle, and wealth. And that's, very, that's our North Star. That's what we believe in. And so use us as a resource. Use us as a resource. I don't care where you are in the country. I take calls all the time from people in Florida, California, New York, Texas, Kansas. I had someone from Chicago call me the other day. I used to live in Chicago. But um, for, for the first time home buyers, like, don't, don't get discouraged. Get out here and get, seek information. Get educated. The more education you have, the more peace of mind you have. So that's, that's, that's pretty much all. And I also want to say, you know, actually, I really appreciate your energy. From day one, I appreciate you. Um, keep doing what you're doing. Keep uplifting the community because that's what you're doing. You're educating people. And that's what we need. Those are the resources that we need. So I definitely appreciate you for having me on. Oh, my gosh, Keith. I appreciate you 20 times more. I guess I, it's all about tangible tips, you all. So we're going to do some questions. We have until uh, a little bit before 7. We have a lot of questions coming in. Guys, don't be scared. Like any, There's no such thing as a dumb question. We're going to answer Absolutely. it. Slash, he's going to answer it. Okay. Someone's saying, um, any experience with Section 8? Oh, I, I, have, I, have, I, have, I have a lot of Section 8 tenants. Um, so um, Section 8, guys, are it's, governed, it's government. Funding basically, you get a renter who needs government assistance for their uh, rent to income, and the checks come. The che- as a landlord, the checks come to you directly, basically. So you get paid by the government to have a tenant in your home. I love Section Eight tenants. Um, I do background checks on Section Eight tenants. I don't discriminate at all. Everyone needs a home to stay, uh, a place to live. So for for Section Eight, uh, basically. That's government funding. That check is automatically going to hit your account at the same time every month of the year. So I have a lot of experience with Section 8, um, especially here in D.C., um, Mississippi, Atlanta. So Section 8 is a good way to go to start out your investment portfolio to get a for sure tenant in there that's going to pay. Because sometimes you have tenants that goes that come into your place that's paying market rent that's not on Section 8. And if they don't pay, it's hard to get tenants out. It's hard to get tenants out. They're not paying. So one thing you can count on with that Section 8 income is it's for sure. you got to get that every month. It's like clockwork. <laughs> it's going to come. I don't, and, and, and even during these times, COVID, Section 8 landlords are happy because they don't have to worry about the tenant not paying the mortgage, the, the, the rent right now. That government, the government uh, uh, rent is going to come regardless. 
So, so, so Section 8 is, is basically like a safer investment in terms of getting tenants because the money is guaranteed coming. Correct. Is there any Correct. negative, any cons to that? I mean, you know, you have your uh, cons of the type of tenants that are looking to be Section 8 tenants. And also, sometimes with Section 8 tenants, you have to make sure the people that they put on an application because their, applic- their money that they're getting is based upon... So their, their their household, like say for example, their rental income, what they what they can get in a voucher, and a voucher is basically how much rent they can get based upon their household um, size. So sometimes people will only add three people to their household size, but they might have five people living there in the house. So you just want to make sure that you're crossing the T's and dotting the I's. And there's a website that's called tenantreports.com. That's how that's how I run my background checks. Uh-oh. Tenants, tenantsreports.com, and you know you, work, you can run, run your background checks and make sure you feel comfortable having one on one conversation with that tenant and get a gut feeling because most of the time that gut feeling is correct. All right, y'all heard it first. Okay, okay. Moving forward, someone asked, would you recommend creating an LLC for the future? Um, we presume this is in regards to. <laughs> using an LLC to buy an investment home. Correct yeah, me. Yeah, that's a great question. Each property you want in a different LLC. You want a different, you don't want anybody to be able to attack your income, attack your parent company. Each property should be in a, in, in a different LLC. So yes, to answer that question, I recommend you do get an LLC. If you plan on, especially if you're planning on investing and renting out your property. And when you create your lease for that property, your lease should be made out between the LLC and the tenant name. Do not, not put your, your name. name on, do not put your name on that lease. Perfect. Can you explain to people what an LLC is? Yeah, an LLC is a limited liability corporation. Right? So what that means is if you have a business, called, my business is called Next Generation Investments. That's my investment business. So if someone went to sue Someone can't, like, that, that's a shield. That's a shield of protection. That LLC is a shield of protection. They can get to next generation investments, but they can't get to Keith James. It's to my discretion of how much money I want to have in my next generation investments account. So that LLC is a level of protection between you and your investment. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep. So you say, you say a level of protection. So yeah, if something be protection. popping off... If you go bankrupt, your my money is not going bankrupt. The LLC's money is. The LLC okay. money is going bankrupt. That's, so it's kind of like a shield in a way. It's a shield of protection. That's exactly what it is. It's a shield of protection. And if someone slips and falls in your home, slips and falls, <laughs> <laughs> that lease is made out between that LLC and the tenant, not you and the tenant. So they can go for the LLC. But the LLC might have might not even have that much money in there. So you don't want anybody coming to you. Especially if you got security clearance, government employees, right? <laughs> so your LLC can be kind of busted. They can't be coming for that. But they, they can't come for you because you got a lot going on. Exactly. God, super smart. You all, this is, I'm telling you, these are tools and tricks to build. This is how people build wealth. This is how people can go bankrupt and they seem to have money all of a sudden. Mm. Protecting protection. Let's yeah. not. We ain't gonna go there. We ain't gonna go there. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and one more. Sorry, really quick. One more question about the LLC for any investor people out there. How do you start one? Like this sounds hard. Is it hard? Um, actually, it's not. So I recommend you getting with a uh, CPA, honestly, um, to file the right paperwork. But you can to get an EIN number and create an LLC. You can go to our irs.gov and create an EIN number for an LLC. Now, once you do that, you want to make sure that LLC, no one else has that LLC out there. So you want to make sure that you're trademarking that name. So when you go to file for a business license, no one else has that name. So that's why I use my CPA. I use, I, that's not my forte. I have a CPA. That's their job. That's why I pay them. You know. So when it comes to me creating that LLC, I know I'm fully protected. Excellent. Okay. So guys, he said a lot and we're not going to delve in too much into this because like he said, this is a, this is a whole nother arena. This gets into legal, yes. like attorney type stuff. Okay, great. Moving forward, someone asked, Maryland or DC, where would you recommend in buying a home? That's actually a really good question. <laughs> that is a really good question. Um, 
So I would say if you can get into D.C. to buy, get into D.C. If your entry level is a bit higher and able, you can get into D.C., go into D.C. If you can't, go right outside of D.C., inside, inside the Beltway, Capitol Heights, District Heights, Suitland, Temple Hill, Oxford Hill, those, those areas are appreciating as well. And Prince George's County are appreciating as well. They are. So uh, even Fort, Fort Washington as well. Fort Washington is another area that's appreciating. But if you can get into D.C., get it, go into D.C. first. If you can't get into D.C., if it's too expensive, go right outside the Beltway where the price point is going to be about $150,000 to $200,000 cheaper and buy your income producing property. Turn up. Turn up. He, he Turn told, up. So, now, so he's saying D.C. preferably, but if yeah. the coin, because the coin is high up in here, y'all. The coin is high in the district. Yeah. There's some zip yeah. codes outside and that that's where um uh is MGM around that area, is that correct? Fort Washington, yeah. Okay. MGM is Fort Washington. Okay, so if y'all trying to get some of them gambling folk jobs. Uh, I can heal too. I can heal too, yeah. Excellent. I will have everything that he talked about in my show notes. I will also have this live posted on my Instagram account so you guys can recount the wonderful That's magic awesome. that was this interview. That's Keith, awesome. thank you profusely for your time and for the the truly like insurmountable amount of information that we got. Thank you so much. Thank Anytime, you. Y'all. You know I'm here for you. Appreciate that, y'all. We're going to get y'all home ownership 2020, y'all. Home ownership. That's, right. That's how we protest. I'm just saying. Mm-hmm.